Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for the National Hispanic Medical Association, How to Prep for It, HIV Prevention, Pandemics, and Current Updates on Ending the Epidemic webinar. I am Petra Fimbres, co-chair of the NHMA Phoenix chapter and the CEO and founder of the Latina Strong Foundation. I am happy to be serving as the moderator for today's event. I will be jo joined along the side of Hector Aranjo, men's board co-chair of the Latina Strong Foundation. Participating in, he participates in collaborative and committees, uh, uh, sorry, across health, youth and human services at the local, state and national level. The National Hispanic Medical Association, NHMA, is a nonprofit association representing the interest of licensed Hispanic physicians across the United States. NHMA's mission is to empower Hispanic physicians to lead efforts to improve the health in Hispanic and other underserved populations in collaboration with Hispanic state medical societies, residents, medical students, and other public and private sector partners. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Petra. Team, today's webinar includes conversations on MPOX, updates, and details of how the pandemic may pose a challenge in the HIV care continuum in the region, and just a few housekeeping rules, team. Here we can see uh, that today's session will feature PowerPoint presentations followed by a live Q&A uh, opportunity for everyone. All participants' microphones will be muted, but please feel free to use the raise hand feature that is accessible via the bottom of your Zoom. And you're also able to post any questions that you have into the chat box for the panelists to address after all of the presentations are done. And just so that you're all aware, recording and slides will be housed on nhmamd.org and sent out after this event. And so today, well, today team, I'm really excited because we are joined by Commander Michelle Sandoval Rosario, Region 9 Prevention through Active Com Community Engagement which stands for PACE, the program director, who will touch on syndemic information at the federal level, following Dr. Melanie Taylor from the Arizona Health Department, highlighting missed opportunities to expand HIV treatment and care in Arizona, and Dr. Jose Rodriguez Garcia, the medical director at Spectrum Medical Care Center here in Phoenix, Arizona, emphasizing as a doctor slash clinic, what can be done to facilitate PrEP and MPOX vaccines. So we hope that our conversation today can highlight the importance of tailored HIV care and treatment services among our community. I will now turn it over to Michelle Sandoval Rosarios to start off our conversation. Welcome, Rosario. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Hector, for the introductions and thank you to all of you for having me here today. So what I wanna do is just give a quick snapshot of um, what we're doing at the national level to end the HIV epidemic and um, some of the work that we're doing around syndemics. But before I get started, next slide, please. I wanted to take us back to the 1980s. Um, I'm assuming some of you on the call were probably um, not around when we saw the first few cases of AIDS, which HIV. So this month, actually, June 5th, marked 42 years since the first five cases of what later became known as AIDS was officially reported to the CDC. And this is what AIDS and HIV looked like in the 1980s. It really hit hard um, the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and for those of us that had loved ones that passed away, I personally have family members that passed away. We, it's, it's, it's almost like PTSD, you remember. And this really was the beginning of an epidemic that was really characterized by fear, death, stigma, discrimination, homophobia, till we know a community that was already really stigmatized and continues. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. It's also important to remember that today and even back in the early 80s, HIV did not, didn't only impact the LGBTQ community. Um, in the early 80s, it became clear that the epidemic was impacting other communities and just gay men. And in fact, in 1983, the first case of HIV in women was identified. And then in 1986, the CDC reported that AIDS was disproportionately impacted Black, African Americans, and Hispanic and Latinos. And unfortunately, we'll see from the data that continues to be the story. Next slide, please. 
Today, for some of you that might not see um, HIV patients, this is what HIV looks like. Um, it represents many faces and diversity, and it can pick, impact anyone, not only the MSM LGBT, LGBTQ plus community. Next slide, please. So I know my colleagues are going to talk a little bit more about local data, so I'm going to take a national um, perspective. I think it's always important to put in picture what HIV looks like in our communities and nationally to really understand how it's impacting um, the patients you're all seeing. So as I mentioned, we've been fighting the epidemic for over 40 years, but unfortunately, we still have 1.2 million individuals living with HIV in the U.S., and we still have over 32,000 new HIV transmissions in the U.S. And if we continue to do what we're doing today and missing those opportunities that we'll talk about, we're going to continue to have over 400,000 new HIV transmissions in the next 10 years. Next slide, please. So I provide a little bit of context of what it looks like nationally, but I think it's also important to look at how HIV disproportionately impacts different communities. This is just the map highlighting some recent data. We can clearly see that the South has the greatest burden of HIV. But also, I want us to pay close attention that our region, the West, also is disproportionately impacted by HIV. And there are many reasons that we can discuss, but it's always important to look at this not only through populations, but also through geographical lens. Next slide, please. We know, as I mentioned in the eight, in the early 80s, that HIV tremendously uh, disproportionately impacts certain communities of race and color, particularly our Black and our Latino. Clearly, we can see here that in 2021, 40% of all new HIV diagnoses were among Black and Latino, specifically not only MSM, but also impacting women of color. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, next slide, please. So I think one of the things that's most astonishing that folks that don't work in the space is a new trend that we've been seeing over the last few years. So although in the beginning of the epidemic, as I mentioned in the 80s, men were the one who were being impacted, we're trying, we're starting to see a pivot and we're starting to see a huge impact among women, particularly young Black women. And as you can see here in 2021, over 50% of all new HIV diagnoses were among Black women when we look across different um, Races, ethnicity, and this also includes um, high rates among our transgender women, particularly of Black. Next color, I mean, next slide. I also want to mention, I think this is also some shocks for some of our non-HIV um, partners at the youth. When we look at the epidemic, although in this recent data, we've seen slight decreases among our youth, we still see those between 13 and 24 who are impacted by HIV. So if you look at that, that's one in five young adults between the ages of 13 and 24 who are being diagnosed every day with HIV. So let's keep that in mind as we talk about how your role is so critical in reaching not only the youth, but many of these communities that we're talking about. Next slide. So I highlighted some data, but I think the most important is that this, this data really highlights the importance of addressing those missed opportunities in many different settings, in particular in the medical setting. We want to make sure we're using every opportunity to not only educate, engage, but making sure we're screening everyone that walks into our door. Because what we know today is that nearly 14% of people living with HIV don't know they have it. And 80% of those individuals are transmitting HIV and don't know that they have it. And in fact, when we look at some of the research and the data, we know that seven in 10 individuals who saw a provider in the last year prior to their diagnose were missed the opportunity to be tested and to discuss PrEP and pre-exposure prophylactic. And one of the things I always mention is we hear over and over stories and talking to Black women that you'll have a woman, specifically cisgender woman, walk in and see their provider for an STI or a syphilis diagnosis, but not once that does individual, does that provider offer an HIV test knowing they're at risk or talk to them about ways that can prevent HIV. And unfortunately, the next year they come in, they've seroconverted. So we hear these stories over and over, and I think it's so critical, the role you're doing to really be able to screen all individuals, because as I mentioned, HIV doesn't just impact one communities. We're all very vulnerable. If you're sexually active, we are all vulnerable. Next slide, please. 
So today, the good news is that we have the tools to end HIV. And just briefly, most of you might be familiar with the, the national initiative. The Ending the HIV Epidemic in the U.S. is a national initiative to reduce new HIV infections by at least 90% in the next 10 years. And this initiative was launched in 2019, and it's a really focused initiative that's focused on 48 counties. Maricopa County is one of those counties and seven rural southern states. And those counties were selected because we know those are areas where we have the largest burden of HIV. So in addition to um, the goal to end HIV in the next 10 years, the initiative sits on what we call these four pillars, these four strategies to end HIV. The first one that I think is so critical is diagnose, diagnosing people as quickly as possible, making sure they know their status, because we must think about how can we get people tested outside of your traditional clinical or healthcare setting. The next one is treatment. So once we're able to diagnose individual, how do we link them immediately in less than 30 days into services or making sure they're getting those services we have antiviral medication. We know that if they if they take it correctly, we can suppress the virus to where it's undetectable and untransmittable. Meaning if I have HIV and I'm on my medication and I'm taking it every day, I can't transmit that to my partner. Again, making sure that we're not only linking individuals to care, but that we are also make, providing the resources they need to make sure they stay. And then prevention. And we'll talk a little bit about, I know my colleagues, we will. We have those tools, PrEP, pre-exposure prophylactics. It prevents HIV by 99%, but we're not getting that information out to those communities as we saw from the data. And then finally, respond, making sure that we're able to identify communities who are most vulnerable and getting out the prevention and the treatment tool to them. Next slide. So our, uh, the federal government has really taken a national approach of how we end HIV through this syndemic and ending the HIV epidemic. We've been hearing a lot what syndemic is. And when we think about the word syndemic, and I'm gonna read a definition here, it's the cluster and interaction of two or more diseases as a result of social or structure of health that leads successive burden of disease in a population. I always say that HIV is a result of us not addressing some of these syndemics. And I know you all do a wonderful job in not only um, addressing the issue, but really looking at the person holistically. So really thinking about how do we address those syndemics. Next slide, please. So our office, I, I work within the Office of Infectious Disease and HIV and AIDS Policy. As I mentioned, we've really taken the syndemic approach. So not only have we released the National HIV AIDS Strategy um, in leadership with the White House, but we've also released certain um, guidance on how to address the STI uh, crisis that we're seeing, viral hepatitis and vaccine when it comes to COVID and MPOC. So we're really looking at this holistically because we know each of them play a role in each other. If someone comes in with an STI, we know that they are also vulnerable for HIV. So I would encourage you to check out some of these plans and see how we're taking this endemic approach. Next slide. And before I end, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing and what we have been doing at the federal level with the MPOX. I mean, we're, we're, we're in the summer months, we're approaching Pride Month, all of us are outdoor gathering. One of the things that we've been working here at HHS since day one is really taking this whole of government, whole of society approach to address the MPOX. There's many lessons learned that we've learned from COVID, right? Things that we did well, things that we perhaps had to do better. So we've been able to quickly really um, engage with all communities, all different sectors to be able to message to those individuals that are most vulnerable to MPOX, making sure that receive their second dose. Although we've seen a few cases in the Chicago area, we anticipate that we will continue to see the rise in MPOX. So we are encouraging our partners to really look at increasing vaccination among communities most at risk, but most importantly, wrapping it around with those other um, areas that we know of a concern, wrapping it around sexual health services, so STI, HIV testing. Um, I would encourage you check out HIV.gov. There's some toolkits that we put there that CDC release. Um, I'm here to always answer questions on MPOX, but I know my Maricopa County partners will talk a little bit about what they're doing locally. And then next slide, please. And then finally, I leave you um, with this. You know, we really have to think outside the box 
How do we really address syndemics, HIV, the MPOC, social determinants of health? What tactics, innovations, you know, how can you as a provider, I know you have a lot of a lot on your hand, lean on, you know, your community health work, your, your nurse practitioner, your nurse to really be able to look at the person holistically and being able to collect them to services they might need to make sure we're addressing and advancing not only HIV, but ending inequalities. And then finally, the last slide. I just wanna leave you with this thoughts. Your role in helping us end the HIV epidemic is critical. We all play an integral part of society. As you can see, it is a role of not only the federal government, the public health department, it's your role, it's the private sector's role, it's everyone's role to be able to advance health inequalities and to be able to really address some of the syndemics that we're seeing and we talked about. And then the last slide, I'm very excited that I had this opportunity to talk with you all. I wanna really encourage you all to attend the next Presidential Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS, which is taking place on June 28 and June 29 in Phoenix, Arizona. And for some of you that might not be familiar with PACHA, PACHA is a, is a body that is made up of leaders from across the country and our federal partners that provides advice, information, and recommendations to the Secretary of Health and Human Services regarding programs and policies, where do we need to do to address HIV inequalities. There's also opportunities to hear from communities and providers. So I would encourage you, please, if you can be there, day one is going to be focused on addressing the epidemic and syndemics among our tribal community. And then day two, you'll get to see, hear from some of our partners throughout the state um, talking about the epidemic in not only Maricopa, but across the state and some of the things they're doing. And then we would love to hear from you all. What are those challenges or what can we do? What additional resources we can provide you to support the work you're doing in your communities? And that is all I have today. Thank you so much. I'll be around for some questions and answer at the end. Oh, I think I lost. Uh... Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, up next team, we have uh, Melanie Taylor from the Arizona Department of Health Services and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome so much, Melanie, and thank you for being here. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to return, and I'm happy to cover quite a bit in this short presentation, but we're going to cover expanding HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP services, and we're going to do a quick overview, or I would say update, on MPOX, both epi and prevention in Maricopa County. Next slide. So let's go ahead and start with a little bit of the epi data, which just gives us some background. Next slide of the issue here in Arizona. We'll start first with a national slide, and I will say that this information is a little bit outdated. So I'm gonna describe that in a minute. This is data that was presented in CROI in 2016, showing a lifetime risk of HIV diagnosis by race, race, ethnicity, and sex. And it's important to consider and to realize that these data have been updated and presented again at CROI 2022, and we do see some improvements. So in 2020, 2016, these data represented the data year 2014, we saw that one in 20 African-American men overall for the United States were at risk, were going to be diagnosed with HIV. And similarly, one in 48 African-American women. The updated data shows from CROI 2022, this is in an abstract format, not really presented, but it does show that that risk is now down to one in 27. Now, although that's an improvement for African-American men, that still represents an incredibly high risk lifetime risk of an HIV diagnosis. It's improved among African-American women to one in 75. Again, these are data that are from 2017 to 2019 presented in CROI in 2022. So the numbers on the slides are older. Um, they are have been improved, but we're still not out of the out of the woods yet. Next slide. So let's talk about some of the opportunities for prevention. And while we do that, let's first take a look at the, the incidence of HIV in Maricopa County. I would like to stop just for a quick second and say thank you to my ADHS partner, specifically Ricardo Fernandez, 
as well as Rick DeStefans and his team for putting together some of these updated figures. What we see in Maricopa County is not a very, not a very unusual or drastic, no drastic changes in the trends of HIV incidents. We know that in 2020, it was expected that we had declines in HIV incidents, not representing true declines, but actually just representing limited access to testing during the COVID epidemic. And that in and that number indeed has rebounded, but not much more beyond what our rates were prior to the COVID epidemic. You can see 541 in 2018 versus 530 cases in 2021. Next slide. What, oh gosh, I think that one got a little bit distorted, but what we see here are overall rates of, I'm not sure why that got so distorted. I apologize for that. I didn't realize that the conversion into the presentation mode on your side would, would do this. But let me describe what this slide represents. This slide represents diagnosis of syphilis, all stages, primary, secondary, early, late, and late, late, and unknown duration for the years 2017 through 2022. And what we see here are drastic increases. Unlike that for HIV, we see drastic increases in syphilis diagnoses across uh, Maricopa County. And next slide. And then we also see increases in also increases among gonorrhea, if you could go back, also increases in gonorrhea during, in Maricopa County during those same, those same years with 2022 data being still preliminary and still under analysis for both syphilis and gonorrhea. So with stable HIV rates, the increasing rates of gonorrhea and syphilis are concerning. And I won't explain that right now, but I'm going to get to it in just a minute. Next slide. So I think what we want to do is we want to take a quick look at what's happening at the, in the rest of the country, particularly for syphilis. And it's important to consider that the, the stages of syphilis, primary and secondary syphilis, are the most infectious to sexual partners. These stages are also the time period where someone is very vulnerable to HIV acquisition because the open lesions are, of course, portals for entry. And these lesions are teeming with the CD4 cells that are target targets for the HIV virus. But what you can see, which is interesting from the epidemiologic perspective, is that over the last 10 years, we've had a dramatic increase and a, a continuous increase in primary and secondary syphilis, with almost a big blue blanket being pulled over the United States. And those rates have gone up even further in 2021. Now, we think that for some reason, the COVID-19 pandemic facilitated the, or in some ways facilitated higher rates of, of syphilis and more than likely this was not necessarily due to changes in sexual behavior, possibly, but due to the diversion of our critical staff that were so key in notifying sexual partners through case investigation and contact tracing for syphilis were, were diverted into that same type of activity, but for COVID. And so that public health practice was somewhat left open and neglected during those COVID years. Next slide. All right, so moving on to the, our counties, uh, and the, these are the most recent data for, for syphilis in, from the CDC. You can see that our northern counties in Arizona have been the, so, those that have the highest rates. Of course, Pima County, Maricopa County are highlighted too, but you can see Coconino, Navajo, Apache are also in that dark blue color. So high rates, next slide. High rates among our American Indian populations in Arizona and nationally. Our American Indian Alaska Natives now have the highest rates of adult syphilis in the U.S., and that is reflected in Arizona as well. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how we might be able to predict who is going to become infected with HIV. One of the things we've done, and this is something I presented um, in different conferences last year, is in Maricopa County, we've taken a look at those patients attending our STD clinic who originally and previously were HIV negative. And we followed them in a period of time across our database into to look at exactly which patients converted to have an HIV diagnosis. And you, what you can see from the blue circles, that's the period or the time point of recruitment at which an, an individual STI patient, for example, came into our clinic 
was diagnosed with potentially other STIs, but on that particular day was HIV negative. The censorship represents the end of, of endpoint of which an individual patient would have been taken out. And some of those patients, uh, that endpoint for all patients was at the end of December, 2022. And some of the patients, uh, my example, with the, the red diamonds or those are the patients that became HIV or had an HIV diagnosis. Next slide. So let's take a look at some of the risk factors. I think it's no surprise that we know that a timed diagnosis might be faster among men. We do still have high rates of HIV acquisition or incidence among men who have sex with men in Maricopa County, and particularly at our HIV clinic, where we do see a large number of MSM populations. Next slide. But it's also important to remember that we have the ability to predict with high certainty populations that are much, much greater risk of acquiring HIV, because we know they're HIV negative to start with, and those are patients who have gonorrhea, but most especially syphilis. And co-infections, of course, facilitate HIV acquisition as well. But please keep in mind, as we talk about PrEP, that if you have a patient with syphilis, that patient is at very high risk of a HIV acquisition. Next slide. So let's talk now about PrEP. First of all, what is PrEP? I think a lot of you probably have some idea about that already, but let's go through it once more. Well, it's a daily dosing of an oral pill, a combination pill. And this combination pill can come in two formats. One is Truvada or Descovy, and each of these contain a tenofovir component, one disoproxyl fumarate and the other with tenofovir alafenamide. And then the emtricitabine component is the same for both formulations. And these are both effective. Unfortunately, we don't have data for Descovy for in cisgender men it's for use in cisgender men or transgender women, but not among cisgendered women. So this method of oral, taking an oral medication once a day ha, is incredibly effective, up to 99% effective in preventing HIV. And it has a US Prevention Services Task Force rating of A, which was in June of 2019. And this is based on the data from Truvada, tenofovir, disproxyl fumarate, plus intracytamine. Now, recently, we do have had, in the last two years, cabotegravir, an intramuscular injection given monthly times two doses, and then every two months, is an emerging PrEP, and in some situations can be an HIV treatment modality, but currently we don't have nationally recognized guidance on patients for where this can be used. It remains quite expensive but it is expected to be one of the emerging methods that can be used for pre-exposure prophylaxis as well. Next slide. Now, I think it's important to remember that it is considered a national recommendation that all sexually active adult and adolescent patients should receive information about pre-exposure prophylaxis. Doesn't mean that they all should be placed on PrEP because that's an individual and a patient by patient decision, but those with higher risk and patients who are sexually active in general should be offered information about PrEP and should be evaluated for their appropriateness to start PrEP and their willingness to start PrEP. It is a core primary care service and there are many missed opportunities. I'll, I'll review a few of those examples in just a minute. It's also important that we increase the knowledge of PrEP among potential users, but also our medical providers and that's you all as well as me as well. And I think it's important in my clinic where I work in the, with uh, the American Indian Alaska Native population in, in Maricopa County exclusively at Phoenix Indian Medical Center, we have combination clinic where we treat patients who have HIV and we start patients who are at high risk on pre-exposure prophylaxis. And they are referred to us from other parts of our hospital or our outpatient clinic system among patients who are diagnosed with STIs. So it's important that we talk to patients who are potential users, those who are diagnosed with STIs, both in HIV settings, but also in STD clinic settings, which is also my setting here, and where we have begin to have a very active dialogue with patients, but also have a very robust referral system. And that also means that we can rely with some certainty that the word of mouth will get out among PrEP users 
and that they will recommend the use of PrEP, we hope, to their other, others, which may be their friends, their sexual partners, other members of their community, or even their family. So it's important that we increase the awareness of PrEP as an option across our community, our patients, as well as our co colleagues in the medical profession. Next slide. All right, so is it worth it? Because I, I do think about it often in my patients, and I've had some, tragically, who have been on PrEP, they've stopped PrEP, and they have, a, they have a seroconverted to HIV. And the question I always think is, how, how is it a benefit? How, what, is the, what is the benefit of, of taking PrEP? And there is quite a significant benefit. If you look at patient populations by the risk categories and compare those to other medical interventions where we do consider the number needed to treat as a low number in order to prevent a certain condition. So for example, if you start on the left side of the left side of the graph, so left side, left side of graph, left side of that graph, you can see that the number needed to treat with of the population who are appropriate to receive a statin drug to reduce cholesterol is only 60 patients in order to, to prevent a single myocardial infarction or heart attack. Similarly, an ACE inhibitor also can reduce death and that number needed to treat is only 56. So the idea with this calculation is the lower the number you need to treat, the higher the, higher the benefit meaning that the strength of that recommendation is very high and the prevention effectiveness of that intervention is also very high. So take a look at PrEP among black MSM and that is represented by the yellow square. And even just at one year, just at one year, you only need to treat 11 in order to prevent a case of HIV. Take a look at the light blue, and that is PrEP among high-risk serodiscordant females in a serodiscordant relationship. And you see that that number of native treaties is also quite low, and that's 1 in 15. And then similarly, among all MSM, that number needed to treat is 37 to prevent an HIV infection per year. Now, there's lots of missed opportunities, and I think that's something that uh, we've heard a little bit about already today, but I think what's important for us to remember is that there are patients who have been, are frequently seen in different medical systems who are either not even, not offered HIV testing, and we have missed HIV diagnoses, but also those that are diagnosed with other STIs and are known to be at risk for HIV, but are not offered PrEP. So that's the situation in New York City among the study in 2017, uh, published just after 2017, where patients who had had a prior negative HIV test uh, had not been offered PrEP. Similarly, in South Carolina, among HIV seroconverters, 25%, as I mentioned, had a diagnosis of an STI, syphilis or gonorrhea, but were not offered pre-exposure prophylaxis. These are prevention opportunities that are missed. And similarly, in the VA, patients with indications for PrEP experienced delays, and in Alabama, similarly, high-risk adolescents at a primary care center had a PrEP indication, but none were offered PrEP. So the opportunities, I think, are... We are clear about the missed opportunities, but I think what we have now are, go ahead, next slide, are opportunities where we can expand PrEP services inside other primary care facilities, primary care practices in our STD clinic, where we're offering PrEP referrals to some of our PrEP providers in the Maricopa County area. I'll provide a list of that. But I think what we wanna do is we wanna make it simple for patients. We wanna inform all the patients and that's what we do in our STI clinic. It's also what we do at Phoenix Indian Medical Center. We wanna make sure that they know that PrEP is available. We wanna make sure they know where it is. We want to make sure that they feel comfortable going to a provider and that we provide a very good, potentially a warm referral and that we assist them with making an appointment. And that's the situation also with other types of team approaches where we have uh, systems in place, but we need to take a team approach to make sure we get patients to those appropriate PrEP services. And then one of the ways that this can be done too is using electronic medical records to offer provider reminders and clinical reminders potentially even in uh, data sets and order uh, combined order sets for patients so that they can be screened in advance of referral and have their test results in hand. In order for us to ask patients and find them eligible for 
prep, we have to ask some pretty simple questions. And that's what we want to do. We want to keep it simple. So these are a few that you could consider. Are you sexually active? Do you have a partner with HIV? Uh, have you had a bacterial STI in the last six months? And some of these can lead you into the consideration of a patient, uh, the patient's eligibility for PrEP. Of course, please remember that all patients um, who are pregnant, uh, by definition of being pregnant, are sexually active. We don't want to forget female patients. And so that's an important consideration, and especially uh, women who have had an STI in the recent past. Next slide. I think now what we can say is that there is uh, there is the opportunity for patients to be referred for pre-exposure prophylaxis, and then the next step is well, how do you what is the what are the clinical tests that need to be performed to determine someone is HIV negative? In the past, we would start patients on prep with a negative antibody test or negative combination antibody 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 antigen test. But now in the recent or updated PrEP guidelines, we do recommend that patients have an HIV RNA for that first uh, with no, without past history of, of being tested. And we do hope that um, that retesting and restarting continuing or continuing PrEP that patients should also get HIV RNA assays. Next slide. So here's some workshops and trainings on pre-exposure prophylaxis. So we'll go on to the next slide. We're going to transition now, uh, uh, well, a few more resources, and then one more slide after that. I see I have uh, just five minutes left, so we'll hurry through. These are things that you can look at later. My slides will be available for providers in our county. Next slide. HIV kits, next slide. OK, so let's talk br briefly and quickly about MPOX. I think that this is a summary slide. You know, it's North Pox virus previously, an animal reservoir and, and transmitted to humans. But it was noted in 2017 that, that some cases seem to be transmitted sexually. And of course, our outbreak and global pandemic, a global outbreak in May of 2022 became very clear. It's important that to note that we have just over 30,000 cases. Next slide, and 42 deaths in the US. It looks like this with distribution across the US. Next slide. And uh, we, there has been a, a definitely a tapering of cases, but it's important that the, to note that there is a resurgence in Chicago where about 13, uh, 30 is, uh, I think, a different reference, but 13 in smaller cluster initially reported uh, came through in Chicago in this year. And about nine of those were, had already received two injections of the Geneos vaccine. And in May, we did have a single case in Phoenix. Next slide. And that patient in Phoenix was a vaccinated patient. This is what the epi curve looks like in Maricopa County, and, or in Arizona, actually. And you can see that we had almost 600 cases, 14 hospitalizations, but no deaths. Next slide. So we'll keep going quickly through some of these recommendations. And I think what we want to make sure folks understand is the, the recommendation. Next slide. Oops. Just so I don't have uh, confused. Thank you so much for advancing the slides. Perfect. Go to the next slide. Great. So I think you're all aware that we need a two-dose vaccine of the Geneos vaccine, two doses of that for best protection. It is important to remember we do have cases uh, diagnosed in one in Arizona and one in and nine in Chicago, at least, of patients who have had two doses of vaccines but still acquired the infection. It's important that we counsel patients to continue to avoid close skin-to-skin -skin contact with someone who has impox even if they've already received the vaccine. Next slide. So those two doses are given across for one dose first day, second dose uh, at uh, four weeks. We still don't have enough patients vaccinated in Arizona. We expect, we, we estimate that only 19% of the at-risk population has been fully vaccinated and only 31% have received at least one dose. Next slide. So the vaccine, we find that it's most efficacious if it's given subcutaneously. You may remember that we were giving intradermal doses when there wasn't enough vaccine to go around. 
but it is recommended when vaccine supply is, can, is available that subcutaneous administration is, is offered. We do have the vaccine here at the clinic where my office is, and that's down at the STD clinic at 1645 East Roosevelt. If you have any questions about availability and other sites, you can contact Isabel Evans at that website below. Next slide, with that email. And it's important to note that even if there are there are many patients who've only received one dose, you can give them a second dose without having to restart. And the patients who have had impox do not necessarily need vaccination, and it should be part of a comprehensive approach to sexual health care. Next slide. And that's my last slide. I'm happy to answer questions in whatever time we have available. Thanks so much for your attention today. Thank you so much, Melanie uh, and the team. Up next, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Rodriguez Garcia, speaking about applying guidelines and resources to clinical practice. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. So, yeah, my talk is going to be of how to apply it, um, you know, what just uh, uh, Mel uh, Melanie and Michelle just talked about and how to apply that into our clinical practice. Um, I know because a lot of times I'm in uh, clinical practice, it's just hard to integrate a sexual history or talk about HIV or STIs when you have the patient that is just talking, uh, uh, they're here for their diabetes, hypertension, they're uncontrolled, they have pain. You know, most of our patients, they come in and they have a huge list of problems, and then those problems definitely is not STIs or HIV. Can you go into the next slide, please? So CDC knows this, and right now they're recommending doing an opt-out HIV testing, okay? And this uh, recommendation is everyone from ages 13 to 64. Definitely if they're 64 and up, I will still recommend um, testing depending on which area you're on. Here in Phoenix, we do have a lot of uh, HIV incidents, so we test everyone across the board and we never finish if they're 65 and up, okay? And then um, can you go back? And then the opt-out approach, right? Um, so what is this? Uh, so before, you know, with HIV came out first, you needed to get a consent. It was a written consent. There was a lot of information that you needed to uh, get from a patient before doing an HIV test. That has changed because we do have effective treatment. Uh, the treatment as prevention or U equals U. It's something really amazing. We have PrEP. There's a lot of resources um, out there that we can do to prevent HIV transmission. So now we have shift onto going onto an opt-out approach. Basically what it is, is you know the same concept as we do every time a patient comes in and a medical assistant or nurse will tell the patient, please get into the scale so we can wait you, right? That's an opt-out approach. The patient has always the option to opt out from that, uh, from weighing themselves. And before we wait them, we don't do any screenings. We don't tell them, oh, this is what obesity is. This is what a normal weight is. This is what underweight is. So that's the same concept with HIV, right? So it's just uh, having them do the test before doing, uh, giving them information, but, but having them uh, notified that we're going to do the test and there's information there. A lot of practice use different techniques. Uh, some of them will uh, place it on some posters where it's like, um, you know, uh, this facility will do HIV testing uh, as an opt-out. Uh, when I went to do my annual wellness visit this year, when I was sitting on uh, the exam room, there was a uh, poster there saying that HIV test was being done as a routine test for like your, for your annual wellness visit. So you're there, you're seeing it, and if a patient has a question, they can always address that. Uh, other facilities, what they have done, whenever a medical assistant is rooming a patient, they go over their medication, their history, and then it's like, oh, you haven't uh, had an HIV test, it is recommended that you get this HIV test. So there's a lot of approach, and this definitely helps, um, you know, decrease that burden that, oh, I don't have time to talk about this, right? And then also, and definitely if a patient has a question or a concern about the test, then that's when, okay, we can definitely talk about it. But in my own experience, since we haven't been implementing this in other clinics when I was doing primary care, 
I feel 99% of the patients, they got their test, they didn't uh, ask any questions or they were not concerned about getting the test. And that 1% that they did, you know, it was just like, oh, what is HIV? What happens if I'm positive or if I'm negative? Uh, you know, questions like that. And, you know, you can address those during that visit or let's make a follow-up appointment to address those and not get tested if they have any questions. Um, also, uh, getting outside from the non-clinical setting, like especially emergency departments, a lot of uh, cities, counties, or uh, emergency departments are doing this approach. And we have had a lot of patients being diagnosed with HIV when they just go to the emergency department for some other reason. And again, like uh, previously was uh, mentioned, there's a lot of missed opportunities to identify those people that are HIV positive or if they're HIV negative that are at high risk. So the first step is always, always getting that HIV test. So that's why it's really important to try to, um, you know, uh, do this approach. And this will also help to remove those stigmas that is uh, with HIV and also with all other ST, uh, STIs like syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, hepatitis. So this should be kind of a panel and a lot of practices you know, do this as a panel. So if you're gonna do an HIV test, you get the full uh, STI panel. Or if they're coming for a syphilis test, we do the full panel, including HIV. Next slide, please. All right. And then once you have a, you know, every time we do a test, there has to be, we are doing it for a reason and what to do if something comes back abnormal or something comes back normal, right? That's something that we have been taught in medical school, never to get a test without having a plan, okay? So if a patient comes in and you do the HIV test, then, you know, just as a routine uh, HIV test and they come back positive, the first important thing is to link them to care. This definitely is going to help and it's going to increase the uh, the outcomes, okay? Here in Phoenix, we do have the Fast Track Cities of Phoenix. So this is an initiative. Um, this is a global initiative, the Fast Track Cities, uh, to help decrease the HIV incidence. And our goal is to link them as as soon as possible, okay? So there's a phone number there, which we call the red phone. Um, you call this number whenever you have an HIV positive patient, okay? So this is uh, from a healthcare uh, facility, so it's not a patient uh, phone uh, that they can call. So either yourself or someone from your staff will call this phone, okay? So just, you know, pick up, you call during business hours. It's like, okay, we have this patient. This patient is HIV positive. What do we do? Uh, the, other, the person on the other side of the phone is like, okay, this is what we're going to do. You know, depending on their insurance, where the patient is located, uh, the address, or how fast, they're going to link them to an HIV specialist or an HIV clinic. Um, our goal is to see them the same day. So here in our clinic, we have uh, slots uh, this, uh, designated just for rapid start. So meaning if you have an HIV positive uh, patient that was diagnosed in the morning and you call this, for, uh, this uh, phone and they are linked to our clinic, we can see them in the afternoon the same day and start them in treatment, okay? So that's why it's really, really important. Um, we have done this initiative and in Phoenix, our numbers of HIV incidents has been decreasing. So it's really, really important. So that way you already know that you can link it and you don't have to worry about like, okay, if I have a positive test, what am I going to do? So you have these options. And of course, this is only for Phoenix, but across the state and the nation, um, you know, uh, you can contact your, uh, uh, the, which is the county public health department, and they have a lot of resources. They have similar um, uh, initiatives across the U.S., so that way you can link that patient. And just knowing having that number or that referral system, it's something really good uh, to have, okay? And if you have a patient that got tested and they're HIV negative, it doesn't end there, okay? So you have to always assess, okay, does this patient need PrEP, okay? And as it was mentioned, it is recommended letting everyone know that PrEP exists, right? Uh, the way I do it with uh, in my primary care clinic is, you know, I just talk to them saying like, hey, have you heard about PrEP? And they'll be like, no, what is that? It's like, oh, it's a medication 
or a treatment option or a medication that you take every day and reduces the risk of HIV transmission up to 99%. And the patient will be like, oh, thank you for that information or, oh, you know what? I'm interested in that. So that's the way to go for that, okay? Next slide, please. And then how to do the assessment. So this is from the CDC, which, you know, there's a lot of assessments so, uh, and a lot of ways to do it. So it's just trying to see which one's the best one that you can apply to your own practice, okay? And this is like just uh, simple questions asking, have you had any anal or vaginal sex in the past six months? If they answer no, you still tell them about PrEP. And if they want PrEP, you still prescribe it, okay? Because sometimes there's still a lot of stigma uh, with sexual health. And if you haven't built that report as well as you want, there might be some uh, things that patients will not ask. And then if they say yes, definitely if their HIV uh, partner is positive and they don't know if they're, uh, if they're unknown or if they're detectable, you can always prescribe PrEP. Or if they have one or more sexual partners that they don't know if, uh, about their HIV status, and definitely if they had any bacterial STIs in the past six months. So that's most uh, of the time recommended. So anytime you treat anyone for syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, always, always prep. It's always something that you have to address with them. Next slide, please. And then also, this is what I teach uh, medical students and residents. Uh, this is also from the CV, uh, CDC, the five P's of sexual histories. So uh, partners, practice, protections from STIs, past histories of STIs, and pregnancy intention. Just uh, having this um, questionnaires is something uh, that will help and to uh, risk stratify a patient. Uh, you can also do this and implement it. We do it as a questionnaire. So whenever a patient comes in for an annual wellness visit, they answer those questions by themselves. And then as a, a doctor, you just review those uh, answers with them and try to see that assessment. Next slide, please. And then for prep, you know, Doing the medical part, it's really easy, but we know those social determinants of uh, health are uh, what uh, make it a little bit complicated. Getting that medication prescribed to our patients or making sure they, um, they take that medication, okay? So PrEP resources, all counties have, um, have resources. So it's just calling or visiting their website and they can definitely help. Here in Arizona, we, we have HIVAZ.org, which is a really good resource of, um, of uh, where to send patients for PrEP, referrals, or how to do it. The other one is plus PrEP please prep me.org, which is also for patients and they, it's really informative, okay? And then if you have an HIV negative uh, test and the patient wants PrEP and you don't know where to send them or the patient is there, there's a, a line that is with care direction. So it's uh, that phone number and you can always call that phone number and uh, they can place the referral to a patient that needs PrEP, okay? And then also CPLC or LUCIS, um, it's also another great resources that they provide uh, case management. And there's a lot of other resources um, uh, out there that can definitely help with that. Okay, uh, next slide, please. And then also Mpox vaccine, as they mentioned before, this is from the Maricopa County uh, Health Department on who should be getting the, uh, the Mpox vaccine. So again, uh, a lot of uh, patients should be on it, especially people that are on PrEP. So all our PrEP patients, you know, when we see them, we also is like, have you had your Mpox vaccine? Yes, no, and it's recommended. Um, and just to let them know, the Mpox vaccine is also uh, part of the small the smallpox vaccine. And you know, we're fortunate enough that smallpox has been eradicated, so the vaccine works. And letting them patients know about that that um, to reassure them that is the vaccine, you know, that has eradicated a disease they're more prone to get it because, you know, they have questions or their concerns or there, there has been a lot of stigma, especially with the COVID vaccine. And they think this is something new. It's like, no, this is not new. It's the smallpox vaccine, which has been given for many years. Okay. Uh, next, back, uh, next slide. Uh, so thank you. This is my contact information and definitely any questions, concerns, let us know and we can answer them.
Thank you so much, Dr. Rodriguez and, and all of our speakers. This was incredible. So team, this is our portion for the question and answers discussion. So if there are anything um, that you would like to ask uh, the folks that, that have joined us here today, uh, please feel free to do so in the chat box. I'm gonna go ahead and check it right now, team. So we're gonna stop sharing the screen in the meantime. And I'm gonna go ahead and check to see our question box here or our chat box team. So as you're thinking of them, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat box or in the Q&A. Let me go ahead and open these up to see if there's anything here. <clears throat> All right. So while anyone can get MPOX, CDC research shows that 40% of people diagnosed with MPOX in the United States also have HIV. Also, people with compromised immunity, like people with untreated HIV, may experience more severe illness or even death. So team, how is HIV and MPOX an example of syndemic outbreaks that interact with each other? Who would like to take that? And I can repeat the question one more time, Tim. How is HIV and MPOX an example of syndemic outbreaks that interact with each other? I can talk about that briefly. This is Dr. Taylor. Uh, hey, Dr. I think what we have to remember is that patients who have HIV, whether or not their CD4 counts are very high or are low, they still have a compromised immune system, whereby the virus itself causes an increased Mm, an increased level of inflammation that may be somewhat dysregulated and still give them a lower form of immunity against other infections and viruses especially. And so this situation where we have similar at-risk behaviors or risk, uh, risk of exposure, let's say, we want to recognize that that is part of a syndemic that's part of a syndemic definition is similar routes of transmission. So across our infectious diseases like STIs, HIV, hepatitis, and now monkeypox, we do have similar exposure routes. And these, of course, increase the risk among patients who are engaging or are being exposed in that regard. So there's a couple of ways that we can consider MPOX as part of the syndemic. And I think that's the primary way that I can consider it, but also to consider that populations that are at risk for one infection are also at risk for multiple. So we have two points whereby the, the route of transmission is similar to other infections like HIV, as well as the populations at risk. And certain things with regard to MPOX may even put them at greater risk, but that is still part of our syndemic definition approach. It's a good question. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, for that context uh, and for the answer. Would anyone else like to add uh, to anything that Dr. Taylor just mentioned? <clears throat> okay, one. No, is there a question? Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, Michelle, go ahead. The only thing I wanted to add is, you know, we're still in COVID. COVID is not going away. The only thing I want to add is if we were to overlay a map of where all the COVID places are, like the hot spots with the hot spots for HIV, hot spots of MPOX, syphilis, it's going to be all the same. So I always say you can remove HIV, you include diabetes, hypertension, it's the same. So we really need to start talking in this language around syndemic social determinants of health to really move forward with equity. So I challenge you all. I know you providers are so busy, but this is why we're here to support you. And also, often we hear from providers, you know, we don't want to test. You know, what if we get someone positive? I'm not an HIV doc. You're not alone. You have great resources with the state, with the local health department. You have fantastic partners, Southwest, um, Southwest Center, you know, all these different community organizations, Chicanos for La Causa, who will really walk you through the process and walk the individual. So that's the message I just wanted to send out, that you're not alone. We're here to support you. And thank you for all you do, because you are really making a difference in the community. So I appreciate it. Michelle, thank you so much. Dr. Taylor, thank you so much. And so to build on that a little bit, Michelle and Dr. Taylor, I'm going to ask a more a uh, specific question around Maricopa County specific. So in 2021, 
is show that 64.8% of incident cases of HIV AIDS resided in Maricopa County, Arizona. What barriers to care exist in the HIV AIDS population in Maricopa County? I would say barriers to care could come in as a perception rather than an actuality. We have many different resources for patients who are uninsured or underinsured. We have a large number of very welcoming and outstanding medical practices. And I would like to sort of turn it over a bit to Dr. Rodriguez as well. And so I think sometimes what can be the actuality is hesitancy and the concern for potential stigma, confidentiality, and people to learn of someone's HIV status. But I believe that the barriers to care are not necessarily that the care is not available, that the referrals are not uh, effective or they're not um, followed up on, because we also have case management systems within our Ryan White, uh, Ryan White component of our AIDS programs, whereby we have very helpful knowledgeable people to hand carry patients to the best care. And I, I, don't, I think that maybe there not, might not be barriers to care, but might be perceptions of how to approach that. And that is what you were, were saying earlier is we need to make sure patients have the awareness and understanding that there's a lot of services at support to guide them. And even Michelle wrote in the, in the chat, I think it's really important to note that we have a lot of partners across the state to help our patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor, and thank you to everyone uh, for being here today. Everyone, I'd like to thank all of our guests for their time and expertise on today's topic. We are at the top of the hour, and as well to all of our live audience for participating today. The National Hispanic Medical Association has partnered with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Let's Stop HIV Together campaign, and the Prevention Through Activity Community Engagement PACE of OSH to maximize the effectiveness and reach of the Let's Stop HIV Together campaign by disseminating HIV resources to communities. A link for HIV Nexus, the CDC resource for clinicians, will be provided in the chat box for clinicians looking to attain HIV resources to incorporate into their practice. A recording of today's discussion will be highlighted on our social media platforms to raise awareness of National HIV Testing Day on June 27th to promote the importance of education and HIV screenings and testing. A link to nearby testing spaces uh, and use of your area code has also been provided, highlighting the testing locator widget provided by the CDC. We'll place all of those links in our communications that follow this session today. We'll also provide resources for, for both physicians and patients in the hispanichealth.info page, featuring tools for conversations on HIV. You can also find MPOX early detection resources by clicking on some of these links and the MPOX prevention posters for resources to share um, as a part of these links. So team, you're going to have all of this information aggregated for you in a great email. So please join NHMA for more information on how to become an active member of our community. We hope that everyone enjoyed our robust conversation. And once again, thank you so much to all of our phenomenal speakers for helping provide context and education to all of us to continue to support our communities throughout the entire country. Thank you all so much for making the time to join us today and thank you for being here. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you, thanks so much. Thanks, Hector, bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, team.